And today, two members from uh, the nation are uh, using transthoracic echocardiography. I hand over this uh, session to the faculty. Today's faculty, I would like to request all the participants to keep the mics muted, videos kept shut till the end of the session. After the session, you can unmute and ask questions and uh, may comment if necessary. And if you, uh, you can also use the chat function to pose your questions or write your comments. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Manjula Sarkar, who is a very eminent uh, cardiac anesthesiologist from Mumbai. She will be the moderating, uh, she will moderate this session today. And Dr. Amarjan Nagre, again, accomplished uh, echocardiographer, a uh, cardiac anesthesiologist. Uh, she will be dealing with the subject, today's subject. With these introductory words, I would like to request Dr. Um, Manjula Sarkar to take over. Thank you once again for joining and I look forward to having you all the time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murlidhar for a kind introduction of mine for the today's uh, gathering. Uh, in the modern era of uh, biotechnological advancement uh, that uh, dealing with uh, 2D eco transthoracic echocardiography is really making our life a little easy for uh, taking care of the cardiac patient. Those are coming to us for cardiac surgeries as well as for non-cardiac surgeries. 2D eco is uh, gaining uh, popularity in view of uh, ease to learn the technique, how to do it. And it is very simple um, a tool for us to take care of uh, our patients uh, in uh, for the better management. So with this uh, introductory remark uh, for the 2D ECO, I would like to introduce Dr. Amarja Nagre. Dr. Amarja Nagre is going to tell us how it is going to be useful in our practice. And um, everybody knows Amarja very well. She is the most dynamic uh, cardiovascular and thoracic anesthesiologist. Uh, and gaining popularity for uh, 2D eco remarks and 2D eco diagnosis and 2D eco management. So over to you, Amarja, for the further uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Over to you, Amarja. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Murlidhar sir, for having me here today and for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Manjula Sarkar, uh, madam, for those kind words. And uh, let us start with the today's session. Uh, so, uh, today's session is very, very important. We all are uh, very well versed with uh, esophageal echocardiography. For, so, for us, transthoracic echocardiography is not difficult at all. So, uh, let us today uh, see the basics of transthoracic echocardiography. The interpretation of echo is the same. Uh, be it transthoracic or uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Just we have to learn uh, the transthoracic modality as to how to acquire the images, how to uh, interpret is no big deal for us as, as, an cardiac, uh, as cardiac anesthesiologists. As we all know, echocardiography is safe. It is a very, very safe modality of investigations. It is non-invasive. It is repeatable. It can be repeated as many times. And the best thing is it is real time whatever is happening inside the heart is on your screen and uh, so you get the correct and the real time information about the um, uh, heart events and we can uh, make the probable changes in our uh, anesthesia management for the benefit of the patient eco provides a substantial structural and functional information about the heart it can be applied in perioperative period intensive care units emergency situations in trauma situations and even as resuscitation aids what does echocardiography do? It assesses the cardiac function in a number of ways. The contractility of the uh, chambers, the chamber size and hypertrophy, valvular dysfunctions, cardiac tamponade, pericardial and pleural effusions can also be diagnosed on echocardiography. Now, uh, in trans esophageal echocardiography, we have variety and a number of uh, 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 views. 
okay the standard views and uh, the uh, uh, other other views uh, or the uh, uh, non conventional views also we have to uh, screen the heart but in trans thoracic we have some limited number they are not as many as trans esophageal views so they are mainly the parasternal views which is the left parasternal and there is also a right parasternal which we will be dealing at the end of the slides and uh, this is mainly the left parasternal view the apical view these two are very very popular the left parasternal and the apical and a lot of knowledge about the heart can be gained from only these two views the left parasternal and apical and trust me they are very very easy uh, to acquire and uh, they you you just need a few um, the pra few uh, 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 practice for only few times uh, to know how to acquire these views left parasternal view and apical are the main two views whenever you 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 do not get uh, these views properly such as uh, patients who are obese or who have heavy breasts or um, patients who have bandages or drains and if, if it is not possible um, or even uh, subcutaneous emphysema in these patients you may get poor windows or post operative patients as well and that time for our rescue comes this subcostal view so subcostal view also you have to be very well versed and it is a very very easy view and uh, everything from the, um, uh, uh, the uh, everything or all the points which you are going to uh, see in the apical and the left uh, and the parasternal views can be sought from the subcostal views as well the fourth is the suprasternal view though this has uh, limited structures are seen through these views sometimes and for us as a cardiac onocerologist this view is also important because we have something important that we can diagnose in this view and uh, we will be dealing it in the subsequent slides now coming to the first uh, and a very important view that is the parasternal long axis view in this the patient position is the left lateral position why left lateral position is because uh, the uh, heart falls near the chest wall when you give left lateral position but as an anesthesiologist in the perioperative period you may not always have uh, this facility that you may put uh, your patient into lateral position or the left lateral position so um, you have to be uh, okay with or to practice with the supine position as well and uh, uh, in the perioperative period it is not that i'll stand on the left side of the patient and do, do my tt examination or the right side of the patient either ways you have to be acquainted with this uh, with it so patient position is the left lateral position uh, transducer has to be placed in the left third to fifth intercostal space near the sternum it is parasternal this is the sternum and, and, and the parasternally you have to place it between third to fifth intercostal space the orientation marker has to be always to the towards the patient's right shoulder in p lax view this is called the p lax view and in this view the orientation marker has to be towards the patient's right shoulder this is the only view my dear friends wherein the orientation marker is towards the patient's right shoulder all views it will be other than the patient's right shoulder okay so, 20 piece or 20 piece 40 piece so other than this view other than this view one second one second please keep all the mics muted except the speaker and the moderator till the end of the talk all the mics must be muted till the end of the talk accepting the speaker and the moderator thank you uh, so the orientation marker has to be towards the patient's right shoulder in pelax views in any other view other than pelax view it will be towards any other position not the patient's right shoulder fine so uh, what structures can we see in the pelax view pelax view gives us humongous information everything from the heart can be sought out here like see here is our probe fine so it is kept on the anterior chest wall relatively transthoracic uh, echocardiography is very very easy uh, as compared to transesophageal echocardiography because it is it is literally the anterior side of the structures because we open the heart we see it daily so we know what is in what is just lying uh, beneath the uh, sternum when you open the sternum you immediately see the right ventricle right so this you keep the probe here in the left parasternal uh, long axis view this is your probe immediately you see the rv 
this is the interventricular septum this is the lv yes the lv then opens into the aortic valve this is the ascending aorta and uh, this is the aortic valve this is the ascending aorta this has to be your mitral valve and the la the inferior wall or the posterior wall or nowadays called as inferior wall okay so this is in diastole you have ecg you get it with ecg if you don't have a ecg actually ideally you always have to have ecg with your uh, films but if you don't have in an emergency cases or something uh, something then you just uh, see when the mitral valve is open it has to be the diastole when the mitral valve is closed it has to be the systole or the aortic valve is open it has to be the systole either ways you uh, can see and uh, these are the structures which are seen in the pelax view what do you assess in pelax views it is the lv systolic function that is the contractility or the ejection fraction as we call it then the dilatation of the chambers the hypertrophies of the chambers the interventricular septal hypertrophy then the mitral valve functions and the, the uh, aortic valve function descending aortic dilatations pericardial and pleural effusions so what i was talking about just now is pericardial and pleural effusion this you can see here all the structures just now i have named here the rv lv the interventricular septum the uh, posterior or the inferior wall or the uh, this is the anterior septal wall to be very precise this is the inferolateral wall and the la the ascending aorta aortic valve mitral valve the aml pml fine so this structure your circular structure is the descending aorta so here starts your ascending aorta arch of aorta and here comes your descending aorta fine so this circular structure is always the descending aorta and anything anterior to that if you see anything anterior to that or any uh, uh, blood or any collection anterior to that it is the it is the pericardial effusion always and anything posterior to that as you can see here is the pleural effusion this is moderate uh, uh, like a moderate sort of uh, pericardial effusion and this is the pleural effusion you can see here okay so uh, this also can be uh, diagnosed in cases of uh, in in pelax views now coming to the parasternal short axis view uh the uh, transverse of the same in the parastatal short axis view you have to keep it in the third to fifth intercostal space but now rotate it 90 degrees clockwise from the parastatal long axis view to visualize the aorta in the short uh, short axis and now the indicator goes towards the patient's left shoulder that is the difference right so what do you see parastatal short axis view okay this is just like the mediesophageal aortic short axis view and uh, but it has to be like upside down so uh, in the transesophageal you see the heart from the posterior side and uh, in trans thoracic it is from the anterior side so that's that is the difference between the structures so there has to be your rv here is your probe uh, anteriorly placed immediately beneath is the right ventricle rv ra this is the la the interatrial septum this has to be the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary uh, main like and which will in cases of uh, uh, so for that we have to diagnose this and besides the uh, besides the la appendage is the left coronary cusp so am i clear in this this has to be the rcc because it is adjacent to the rv uh, or the rvot and uh, interatrial septum it is always the non coronary cusp the remaining is you can say is the lcc or you can just say it is the Uh, some uh, the cusp which is adjacent to the la appendage is the lcc now coming to the parasternal basal short axis so up till now what we have done is we have seen the parasternal long axis view wherein you have viewed the heart in the long axis then we have cut it and we have seen it in the 90 degrees but directed upwards directed upwards so towards the head so we could see the parasternal short axis view of the aorta 
we have we have cut the aorta and we we saw the aortic short axis view now we are going to tilt it a bit downwards towards the patient's left hip towards the hip we are going to uh, uh, going to uh, tilt it and we can see now the mitral valve apparatus so there are three views parasternal short axis view the three views that is the basal short axis view the mid papillary view uh, short axis view and the apical short axis view so now we see the basal short, short axis view the basal short axis view is we can see uh, we uh, uh, see the mitral valve uh, uh, in 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 the in the short axis view this is the mitral valve with the anterior mitral leaflet the posterior mitral leaflet we can see all the walls of lv very nicely very beautifully they can be seen here the interventricular septum can be seen and part of rv also can be seen in this parasternal basal short axis view okay the walls of lv which we are very much interested to know the regional wall motion abnormalities they are also seen here as we all know there is the 17 segment uh, model and uh, the six walls uh, seen here they are also very very important uh, since this is the anterior side this has to be the anterior wall the inferior wall the anteroseptal wall, inferoseptal wall, anterolateral wall, and the inferolateral wall of the LV in the basal short axis view. Now, you tilt the probe somewhat more towards the patient's left hip, and then you can see the two papillary muscles. This is the uh, posterior medial papillary muscle. This is the anterolateral papillary muscle. Again, the walls of LV are seen are the same. The nomenclature is the same, but they are now one segment. Uh, downwards or in the uh, mid papillary region okay and uh, this 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 particularly uh, this parasternal mid papillary short axis view is very important to diagnose the regional wall motion abnormalities and hypovolumia as well see here you can uh, diagnose the regional wall motion abnormalities now this uh, is like uh, Ejection fraction 30 to 35 percent, you can see, and you, you have a mild hypokinesia in uh, all mild to moderate hypokinesia in uh, all the segments seen in this mid papillary view. And this is particularly of importance to us again because you can see these two papillary muscles they are causing uh, mid systolic obliteration of the LV cavity, they are causing systolic ob obliteration of the LV cavity, and this is also called as the uh, kissing papillary muscle sign because they come and touch each other uh, during every contraction. So this is this uh, this like this is pathognomonic or this is very very important, uh, which makes the diagnosis of hypovolumia. Okay, so this is hypovolumia, which gives us gives you this uh, mid systolic uh, obliteration of the LV cavity. Now we tilt to the probe further downwards and you get the apical view. Okay, so this is the apex of the LV. This is the apical view of the LV. So these were uh, the parasternal apical short axis view. So up till now we have dealt with apical long axis. Uh, we have dealt with parasternal long axis view, short axis view, and the uh, uh, apical uh, short axis view as well. Parasternal, parasternal. Uh, a short axis view as well now coming to the apical four chamber view now uh, here the patient is again into the supine position with the left lateral tilt ideally and now you place your probe in the fifth intercostal space in the left mid clavicular line or at the apex impulse so this is the fifth intercostal space in the left mid clavicular line or at the apex impulse you place the probe you have to find out the best view and the orientation marker is now towards the patient's left shoulder so this is the apical four chamber view. The ideal view uh, is seen here. And how do you diagnose or what all information do you get from this view? So the important thing is like the most, uh, the uh, globular largest chamber is always the left ventricle. In ideal situations I'm talking about is the, the uh, largest and the globular chamber is usually the left ventricle this doesn't this 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 usually forms the apex this is the left ventricle and this usually forms the apex okay the other chamber which is the largest normally as triangular in shape 
is usually the RV doesn't form apex normally. Unless it is dilated, it doesn't form apex. So this is the LV, this is the RV. One more sign why this is RV is the moderator band. Mo uh, moderator band is always seen as a white strip in RV. So RV is triangular. RV doesn't form apex as a moderator band. One more important sign because we all atrium, left atrium always shows uh, the openings of the pulmonary veins, as you can see here. So the remaining is the RV. No, sorry, RA. So this is the LA and this is the RA. So uh, this is the apical four chamber view. Uh, what does it assess? It assesses the ventricular function, the contractility, dilatation of the chambers, hypertrophy of the chambers, and pericardial effusion as well. Now, apical five chamber view. Now we have to open the uh, open the avota. What you have to do to open the avota? You have to angulate the uh, ang uh, the, the transducer towards the patient's head. Always. Uh, whether it is uh, your probe is um, anywhere, uh, may it be transesophageal or uh, transthoracic, whenever you want to open the aorta, you have to angulate it towards the, uh, to, uh, uh, towards the patient's head and you open the aorta. So a uh, left ventricular outflow tract is uh, seen here, the aortic valve and a part of ascending aorta can be seen here. This is the apical five chamber view. So this is the apical five chamber view, which is uh, classically seen here. Fine. Now, what do you do is the transducer is rotated counterclockwise from the apical four chamber, uh, four chamber position counterclockwise till the RA and the RV disappear. And now what you see is the LV and the LA and the anterior wall and the inferior wall can be seen here nicely. You further rotate counterclockwise from the previous position with a slight angulation towards the head and you see the third chamber opening that is the aorta. This is also called as the long axis view, apical long axis view or the apical three chamber view and the ascending aorta is displayed here. Now coming to very important another view that is the subcostal view. We have to be very well versed with this views because a lot of information can be sought from this view as well. So the transducer is kept now in the subzipoid region. The indicator is towards three o'clock position. You need not remember the, all these things always. You just remember that it should not be towards the patient's right shoulder. The four chambers uh, can be seen uh, nicely beneath the liver. That is the, uh, here, here you can see nicely. This is the liver, this is the RA, the RV, LA, LV, the interatrial septum, interventricular septum, and the uh, tricuspid valve, the mitral valve can be seen nicely in this view. Rotation of the transducer counterclockwise towards the left side displays inferior vena cava in long axis. You have to rotate the transducer counterclockwise towards the uh, left side to get the inferior vena cava. So this is how the inferior vena cava will be seen uh, connected to the RA. You have to always, always, uh, always see the connection or the continuity between the IVC and the RA to name it as IVC because sometimes if you tilt it towards the patient's uh, 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 patient's right, uh, then again uh, towards towards the patient's left more of more of then the aorta can also be displayed here. Okay, so you have to always see. Uh, the continuity between the IVC and the RA to name it as IVC. So this is the subcostal view and you can see this is the RA and yes, this is the opening of the IVC and this is the IVC in the long length. Yes. And uh, you, can, you, can, you can see the continuation of the, this is the hepatic way and this is the IVC. Hmm. So these are the, these are some of the applications of uh, this view. It is very important. This is the ECMO cannula in uh, IVC, uh, which you can see. So this is very very important view, and we have to be very well versed with this subcostal view. It is very easy to take. And if you are unable to take, you have to just ask the patient to take a deep inspiration so that uh, it, it it gets visualized properly. So this is the full length IVC you can see and the whole length of the cannula can also be 
senior very nicely in this view. This is the IVC thrombus, which is senior from renal cell carcinoma. Now coming to the last view as such, <clears throat> the standard last view, that is the suprasternal view. The transducer is placed in the suprasternal notch. The uh, transducer's indicator is towards the patient, uh, towards the one o'clock position, uh, as you can see here. And you can see uh, this, these many structures. This is the aortic arch fully, the ascending aorta and the arch. This is the brachiocephalic uh, artery, the common carotid artery and the subclavian artery, descending aorta and the RPA is visualized here. This is the LA. And uh, let me tell you, it is very important to you for us as such because the tip of the IIBP can be seen here. It has to be always beneath the subclavian artery, artery right? So uh, the in the descending aorta, tip of the um, uh, of the IABP will be seen here. One second uh, second application of this uh, suprasternal view is that the uh, PDA is diagnosed in this view. The RPA, it is the connection between the uh, usually the PA and the descending aorta, which can be seen, and the device can also be seen here. And so this is our uh, recent uh, patient. And uh, just see, this is the device in C2, which can be seen in this view, okay? So this is the device here in C2, PDA device. Now coming to uh, some unusual views, but they are very, very important views. And this, this can be called as the additional views to uh, gain some more import, uh, information about the uh, structures. This is the right inflow view. And in this, what we have to do, how to take this view is you just keep the left parasternal uh, axis, you get the first, you get first, and then you, you just tilt the probe towards the patient's right hip towards the patient's right hip to see the tricuspid valve. To see the mitral valve, it was towards the patient's left hip. Now it has to be towards the patient's right hip and you see the whole of the right system, the RA, the tricuspid valve, the uh, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet and the RV. And you see this IVC and SVC as well. So this is also called as the bicable view. When you get this bicable view, you can get the information about the SVC and IVC as well. You have to tilt the probe towards the patient's right hip. Another view is the RV inflow outflow views. In this, you can see the pulmonary uh, valve and the main pulmonary artery and the RP and LPA can also be seen in this view very beautifully. So this is the uh, main pulmonary artery, RPA and LPA can be seen in this view. Now coming to another view, that is the right parasternal view. This is the, this is the additional view wherein you have to place the uh, probe on the right parasternal area between 3rd to 15th intercostal space, just write the left parasternal view. And you can see the aortic valve here and the ascending aorta. So sometimes when you have to see the ascending aorta, you, you, you can see it from the right parasternal view as well. So this is the aortic valve and the ascending aorta can be seen in this view. This is the right parasternal view. This is the subcostal uh, bicable view. Just now I had shown you a bicable view from the uh, parasternal uh, re region. Uh, that, uh, but now this is this from the subcostal. You you see the RV, uh, sorry the RA. You see the IVC, and then you can again see the SVC as well. So this is the subcostal bicable view. And how to take this view is first you have to uh, get the IVC as such and then increase the depth and angle of the transducer towards the head. Uh, you you uh, angulate the transducer towards the head which brings SVC in position and at the bottom around 5 to 6 o'clock position you see the SVC also. This is also called a snail view wherein you can see the shell as the RA and the head as the IVC and the tail as the SVC. So this is called as a snail view and which is also called as the bicable view, wherein the interrogation about the SVC and IVC can be done. And it is it is very important to evaluate the tip of dialysis catheter, pacemaker leads, the flow pattern in the SVC also. It is best for the SVC spectrodoppler as the uh, echo, echo uh, is parallel uh, uh, to the SVC in this view. And so this is the classical SVC view or the snail view. The RA, SVC, uh, SVC and the IVC can be seen here. 
So that was all from my side today. And thank you so much, Muridhar sir and Manjula madam for having me uh, here today and for this uh, opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amarjan Agre and Dr. Manjula Sarkar for this excellent talk. And uh, Dr. Manjula, can you unmute and uh, take the discussion forward? Yeah. Thank you, there sir. Are, uh, yes. Thank you, sir. And thanks, Amarja, for such an excellent lecture. As <laughs> usual, your lectures are always, uh, you know, worth listening. Thank and with the, with the help of such a small uh, 2D eco um, tool, we can find out so much about the patient and uh, so much uh, detail about the system. There are a few questions in the chat box. I would like to uh, tell you about that and you can answer. The first question is, in which view to best evaluate the regurgitation and stenosis of aortic mitral and tricuspid valves? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the aortic valve, uh, uh, what I would like to say is uh, all the valves, as you have named them, should be evaluated mm -hmm. in all the possible views, mm -hmm. be trans thoracic or trans esophageal. You need not do it in one view and then uh, comment about it. So uh, okay. ideally what has to be done is you have you have uh, two, three views as such wherein you, you can interrogate these valves. That is the parasternal uh, long axis view. Mm -hmm. Then we have parasternal short axis view wherein the mm -hmm. uh, mitral valve also the parasternal aortic valve uh, short axis view is also excellent view. We have to evaluate them in both the valve, uh, both the uh, 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 views. Also the mm -hmm. apical views are very, very useful. For uh, mm -hmm. tight speed valve and mitral valve, the apical uh, uh, five chamber view is important for uh, interrogating the uh, uh, the uh, aortic long axis view as well. So the advantage of trans thoracic is echocardiography here is that you know uh, sometimes in trans esophageal echocardiography we may find it difficult to uh, go into the trans gastric uh, deep deep trans gastric view to interrogate the uh, aortic valve in the long mm -hmm. axis, but here the uh, five chamber view is very easy to acquire. Okay, so, so if, if you are preoperatively, you do that, and postoperative also, if you do that, it is it is it is of much use useful, I think. Yes. So you mean to say that uh, you can't uh, find out uh, in one view all the valves, and we have to take the different views to decide and uh, to get the proper information regarding any of the valve, right? Yes. So all the views have to be always interrogated uh, before you come to a conclusion about any valve. Okay. Now the second question is, a wonder, a wonderful presentation and explanation. Thank you. So many people have said this and excellent talk. So many people has told uh, this. Now, I want to know which are the difficult things you find you are not able to diagnose with the help of 2D echo and you have to confirm it with the transesophageal echo. Can you comment on that? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, actually, transthoracic echocardiography is very, very limited. Hmm. Firstly, uh, we, have, uh, we have only anterior chest wall to see. We cannot rotate mm. the probe uh, in various directions and in various angles as we do it in uh, trans esophageal echocardiography. So, mm. trans esophageal echocardiography is very, very versatile, one thing. Mm. Secondly, uh, trans uh, esophageal, there are n number of views. We have standard views, we have alternative views, wherein we can interrogate each structure uh, from uh, many, many views. Here, mm. it is not uh, possible as such. Thirdly, very important thing is perioperatively, where cardiac anesthesiologist deals with, at that mm. time, trans esophageal, trans echocardiography, trans thoracic echocardiography has its own limitation. Mm. Later on, we have uh, we have uh, bandages and we have drains and then uh, we have uh, the edema, chest wall edema, 
okay so always we have this problem of having poor windows post operatively hmm so, so the limitation in the post operatively transthoracic yes. echocardiography as such perioperatively for hmm. cardiac anesthesiologist are lot more in transthoracic echocardiography we that is why transesophageal is very much popular amongst us because it sorts a lot of information for us perioperatively yes okay there is another question how to get the best apical two chamber and apical three chamber views mean pro pointer position okay uh see for the best apical views if you are a novice what you do is you tilt the patient toward the left uh, uh, left lateral position firstly okay and what you do is you just put the probe directly on the patient's apical uh, apex apex bit where you can mm -hmm. feel the apex bit that is mm -hmm. one thing if you don't feel that properly and if you don't get the uh, uh, get the view properly over there what you have to do is you have to go from the most downward and the most lateral words hmm. from most downward and lateral word position where you, now, you have hmm. to come up hmm. okay. come up from the downwards and lateral most position come up towards hmm. the apex bit and then you can see the uh, view properly for that hmm. also you have to again press your probe a little bit on the chest wall then only you will get good views and the pointer position is like uh, towards the patient's right shoulder or two o'clock position somewhere in between that it is somewhere in between one to two o'clock position or sometimes even uh, three o'clock position that that is sort of uh, variable okay but one to two o'clock position you get the uh, view nicely mm -hmm. How much should be the learning curve uh, you feel for the beginners uh, to get the uh, well acquainted to the transthoracic echocardiography? Uh, learning curve. Learning is, curve. How learning much curve time? Is, uh, learning curve is not uh, very long uh, because one thing is we are well versed with the uh, trans uh, esophageal echocardiography. So interpretation of views is mm -hmm. not a problem for us. Mm -hmm. Only to acquire the views, uh, I think you need a little mm -hmm. bit of practice. And with little bit of practice, we get. But we mm -hmm. have to just have have our hands on always uh, in the post operative period. Even if the uh, windows are poor, you have to keep on getting them. We have a lot of time during our duties and all during um, uh, in the uh, ICUs. Uh, and on post-operative patients or even when we do the pre-anesthetic checkup mm -hmm. of the patient at that time lot many times I do I, I do a lot of trans mm -hmm. uh, echocardiography in my PSCs only so if mm -hmm. you have a patient of 20% is action fraction mm -hmm. or a dilated LV or cardiomyopathy you can just take probe mm -hmm. in hand and you have to just interrogate and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that is how you get used to trans echocardiography uh, someone is, madam, someone is asking, ma'am, again, pointer position in all the views, please. Uh, Sushrita, this is very, very easy. So that is why I was uh, again and again telling the same that you just remember that the pointer position in the P-lax view, that is the parasternal long axis view, has to be, the, has to be towards the patient's right shoulder. In all the other views, it, it will be other mm. than the patient's right shoulder. You just remember that it has to be towards the patient's right shoulder mm. in PLAX view. In anything other, it is other view, it is anything mm. other than the patient's right shoulder. Okay. In the PLAX, it is mm. right shoulder. In the uh, short axis, it is the left shoulder. In the subcostal, it is towards the third uh, three o'clock position. Uh, in the apical views, it may be left shoulder or one to two o'clock position. Don't remember all these things. Just uh, if you uh, do small manipulations, you get the views. Okay. Yeah. So it is easy that do the small manipulation and you will get all the views and all the information with simple uh, manipulation of the probe, right? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Small manipulations and you get them. Only we have yeah. to remember okay. that. Okay, so uh, according to me. Okay. 
Yeah, so according to me doing the transthoracic echocardiography in PAC area, or yes. uh, even a quick assessment uh, by this tool in the emergency situations or for the emergency cases, if you will make a routine to do it for all the cases, those are coming to you, it will be easy for you to make the diagnosis. system is concerned. You will take as a routine tool. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, Manjula, ma'am, please unmute your mic, ma'am. Hello. Hi, ma'am. Hello. So we would like to conclude the session here. Excellent uh, talk. Kamarja, and I hope that all the participants got the general uh, information regarding this uh, uh, technique and this tool is concerned. And if you practice it for um, transthoracic echocardiography for uh, routine practice, it will be really useful. So thank you once again for you all. And Sanish, we can conclude now. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you, thank you everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye.